You ever uh, been kind of down or been frustrated? Things don't seem to be going uh, the way you'd like them to go, and maybe you're getting frustrated easily. Maybe you're at the end of your rope. I don't know. Uh, you've got uh, frustrations. Maybe you've got questions about things. Why are things happening? Sometimes uh, in stages of life, we feel overwhelmed, especially if we've got a lot of small children. Uh, it seems overwhelming to try to minister to their needs in our day and time. Uh, maybe it's in your job. I know sometimes even, even as a pastor, you know, I just, I just feel like, oh, I'm just overwhelmed. I can't get it all done. I, I don't know if I'm doing that good a job or not. You know, God, give me some understanding. Give me some answers. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, ready to throw in the towel in certain situations and relationships sometimes and in family situations. And sometimes I just don't have the energy uh, to maybe get across the finish line. Or maybe you've got some temptation in your life and you just can't get a handle on it. And you, you, just, you just keep succumbing to this temptation and you're fighting it, but you keep succumbing and, and, and you want to have a victory. Uh, really what, what you need is, is, is a restoration. You need a restoring. Uh, it's not a vacation you need. You don't need to just go away for a week, you know, and, and rest a little bit. You need to be restored, uh, renewed. You need to have new hope and new joy. Uh, and and a, sometimes seven days away on a vacation, even at a beautiful place, isn't going to give you that. Uh, it's something that, that comes from inside, and you just need to be restored. You need a, a complete makeover. Uh, you need God's favor on your life. You need God's blessing, God's reassurance. And, God's refreshing spirit. We're studying uh, in Psalm 23. Uh, these past, uh, or we're going to study for a few weeks. Uh, and last week we started with Psalm 1, and uh, today we're going to uh, read, uh, focus on Psalm 2, uh, chapter 23, verses uh, 2 and 3. Uh, but I'd like for you to read with me uh, responsively uh, this psalm today. And if you would... Uh, Well, it's not up there. Y'all all remember it from, uh, probably from heart. Let's stand together. And uh, read responsively Psalm 23. Maybe you can look it up in your Bible. Uh, I, told, I told you last week when we did this, we didn't all have the same uh, Bible or the same translation. And we just uh, said it, and, uh, and God understands it. So uh, let's read it together. You might remember it from heart. Uh, I had it on the slide, but evidently the slides were put out and processed before I recorrected it. Anyway, <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Now, this psalm is, is a psalm that brings great comfort to a lot of people and has throughout history. It's written by uh, King David. Maybe at the end of his life, I don't know, but he, he, is, he is very sure that God has, has led him through life and God is there and God's his shepherd. Uh, the question, I guess, comes is, is why would God allow you and me to go through uh, difficult times sometimes? Why does he put us through, 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 through the ringer sometimes, it appears? And uh, we, we lose family members, there's death, there's suffering, uh, there, there, there are financial woes and, and problems in relationships with spouses and children and all kinds of things. And uh, why, does, why does God put us through these times of testing so that we, we need to be restored? Well, I think God has a process here. Uh, number one, 
When he makes me to lie down in green pastures, that speaks to me that, that he leads us to a crisis. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit more. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Uh, he leads me beside the still waters. He guides us through a process. He leads us to where we can, we can get the, the refreshing that we need. And he restores our soul. He, he, we arrive at a place of peace. So I want to look at the first one for just a minute. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. In sheep terms, and I'm not a sheep, except we talked last week uh, about we all act like sheep. <laughs> uh, sheep are kind of smelly, and, and they're a little not, not the brightest animals on the planet. And uh, so uh, God, in using this analogy of us as sheep, is trying to get us to understand uh, we're weak, and we need him. We need a shepherd. We need somebody to guide us and lead us because we can't do it on our own. Uh, and so he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Green is probably uh, the best uh, grass that, that, that a sheep uh, has to, to feed off of. And God offers a plentiful supply to the, to, uh, to the person who will lie down. But he makes me lie down, it says here. He, he, he doesn't say, well, it would be a good thing if you, if you lay down. Uh, it doesn't say he helps me to lie down. It doesn't say he suggests that I lie down. It says he makes me to lie down. Huh. I think he's trying to get us to understand here that so often we think we know where the pastures are the greenest. We think we know what's best for us. And so we run off and, and get ourselves sometimes in all kinds of straits and issues, you know, I'm in love, you know, and so that love makes us do stupid things sometimes, you know. Not that love's bad, <laughs> but we think we know what's best for ourselves. And so uh, the psalmist says here, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sometimes we think uh, it's greener on the other side, and so we jump from where we are to get to the other side, and we get to the other side, and we found out that grass is just like the grass on our side, <laughs> You know, it turns brown. You got to mow it. <laughs> you got to do everything to that grass that you had to do uh, with the grass on this side. Here it is. If we neglect our relationship with Christ, he will make us lie down. Very important thing for us to understand. Uh, maybe he wants to put us in some pastures to feed us that are not pastures of our own choosing. <laughs> They're pastors, pastures that, that he chooses for us, chooses for us and, and he knows what's best for us. And he puts us there to deal sometimes maybe with our rebellion or our stubbornness. Uh, maybe sometimes he puts us in a hospital bed. Maybe sometimes it's God that's put us in the funeral home. Because of someone in our family. Maybe it's sometimes God leading us when we get that pink slip and we lose our job or our bank account is overdrawn and we don't have enough money. Or, or maybe we're in a period of loneliness. Maybe that's our pasture. Or, or, or maybe we're in a painful relationship with a child or a spouse and, and we're seeing somebody else suffer. Or maybe we're suffering because of that relationship. See, we tend to be rebellious in spirit, and that's why the Bible uses this analogy of sheep. <laughs> we, we, we're prone to wander off. We're prone to do our own thing. See, there are two kingdoms in the world. There's the kingdom of God, and we pray for that kingdom to come in, in the model prayer, in the Lord's prayer. We pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And the reason God wants us to pray that, that prayer is, is we need to seek God's kingdom, seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will sort of work together, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in Matthew. You know, seek his kingdom. So there are only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of me, or the kingdom of self. And it disguises itself in all kinds of ways. It can be ball, or it can be uh, sex, or it can be lust. It can be just all kinds of things, but it's, it's selfishness. It's me. It's what I want. And what we need is the kingdom 
of God, and, and we're prone too often to be self-centered, centered, and we want to be uh, self-dependent. We want to be independent in a sense, and God needs sometimes to get our attention. Sometimes God allows us to be broken so we can realize our need for Him. Sometimes God allows us to be broken so we can realize our need for Him. Philip Keller, great author, wrote a book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, several years ago. And he says in that book, and I'm not familiar with all this, but he says in, in, in Middle Eastern culture, in, in, in a, with, a, with a shepherd and the sheep, that sometimes there's some sheep that just keep wandering off and wandering off and little tiny lambs. And they'll wander off and keep wandering off. And, the, and so the shepherd, they won't follow the shepherd. And so the shepherd sometimes will take them up and hold them in his lap and break their tender little leg so that they can't go off anywhere else. Now that's painful and that hurts. But the shepherd's doing it out of love for the sheep. That the sheep won't wander off and get into things that he shouldn't get into. He needs to lie down in the green pastures. And so the psalmist says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He doesn't allow me. He makes me. And I think that's very interesting. That, that God makes us lie down for our own protection and our own good. He wants to bring us to a place where he can restore us, but we can't re be restored until we get in an alignment with his will and what he wants us to do. He wants us to humble ourselves before him. H have you ever been in a place of genuine humility? Are you there right now with God? Are you in a place in life right now that you're saying, God, I can't do it. God, I need you. Do you get up every morning and say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this. I want you more than anything in the world. I want you to, to show me where the pastures are. You know, get my life straight. Brokenness doesn't just say, God, I need you. It says, God, you are all that I need. You're all that I want. I'm not going to make any demands or any requests. Jesus is enough. Just give me Jesus and I'll be satisfied. He's all the world to me. You ask, well, what should I be broken of? Well, I, I know what I need to be broken of. I need to be broken sometimes of this. I, I can do it all myself attitude. <laughs> I feel like sometimes nobody else can do it as well as I can do it. I just got to do it myself. You know, well, maybe God wants other people to do it, even if they don't do it quite like I want it done. And maybe he wants me to learn to be happy with the way other people do it. You know, God needs to break us of our stubbornness. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> or our pridefulness, or our willfulness. You, you can't make me do that. You know, it's my right. I, I need to, I want to do what I want to do. It, it, you know, I got rights. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that if you're a Christian, you have, are dead. You have died to self. Uh, you've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own. God owns you. You're his slave. You know, I don't think we really, really grasp that. That's why we go off and we get in all these other pastures that aren't the pastures that God chooses for us. Somebody offers us godly advice, you know. Well, I love this person. I'm in love. And, you know, all these red flags, boom, boom, boom. And your friend comes along and says, whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, I'm in love. I know what I want. This is the best thing in the world for me. Don't tell me what I ought to do. You know, that's, that's, that's what gets us in trouble. Or, you know, I, I've suffered a lot, and, and I just deserve this. I just want this. I've got to have it, whatever it is. I think that's what God's trying to break us of, you know. Uh, if, you've, if any of you have ever raised children, you understand what I'm talking about, you know. I, trying to deal with my children as they were growing up, my, and my parents trying to deal with me. I can remember, I, I, thought, I thought I knew what, what was best for me, and this is what I want, you know, at 13 years old. I knew, 14, 15, I knew what was best for me. And my parents and other people would try to guide me and steer me in the right way, and I, I didn't want any part of it. 
Listen, Jesus wants to get us to a place. He wants us to make, make us lie down in, in the pastures that he wants of uh, where we get to the point where we say, I can't do it, Lord, but, but you can. And I want you to do it. I'm nothing, Father. I am nothing without you, and I need you because you're everything to me in the world. You know, I can't, but you can. I won't, but you will. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And so if you're going through a difficult time right now, sometimes that's so God can get us to the point we need to be. And maybe he's trying to get you to quit trying to run away, but try to lay down and stop where you are and, and just try to figure out what it is God's trying to tell you. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. This is where he takes me through a process. Uh, still waters. Uh, throughout the Bible, water is a picture of refreshing. The refreshing work of the Spirit in, in our lives. You know, you and I can't live without water. We're going to die. We, we get thirsty. You know, I don't know about you, but, but a lot of people drink all kinds of drinks, tea and soda, and I do too. But when I am really, really thirsty, if I've been out and, and I've been working hard and perspiring and, and, and I've been away from a source of, of water, nothing quenches my thirst like water. You've got to have water to survive. And, and, and God is saying here that, that he will lead us to the place where the still waters are, where we can get our thirst, our needs quenched, and, and, and we can be filled, and we can be restored. But I'm told that, that sheep don't like to to go by fast-moving water. They like still water. And, and the shepherd knows where the quiet, deep, pure water is, you know. Sometimes you ever drunk any water that just didn't taste good, been down to the beach, you know, taste the water. If you don't have a filter that they pump in, you know, into the kitchen sink, it, it doesn't taste good. You need a, a filter on it or something or had a bad well. But God knows where that that good water is, and he wants you to have the good water. He wants you to be refreshed and restored, and he wants you to have that still, deep, pure water. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Can, can you just picture Jesus saying that? I mean, I, I often think I would have loved to have walked with Jesus on this earth and been one of his disciples. Wouldn't it have been great to hear everything that Jesus spoke? I mean, it would have made your heart burn. But we'd have been like the rest of the disciples. We'd have, we'd have got off the path. We wouldn't have followed the shepherd. And, and boy, he'd have, he'd have taken us through some tough times where we'd have scratched our head uh, a whole lot and wondered what in the world he was doing in our lives. You know, shallow waters run real fast usually uh, over the rocks, and, and they make a lot of noise. Listen, what he's saying here is he wants to lead you to the still waters, the deep waters, the quiet waters. We need to take time in our life. If we want to know the will of God, we need to take time to know him. We need to get into the deep things of God. Jesus repeatedly got alone. He went up to the mountain to pray. He, he, he got in a boat and took off. He got up early in the morning. In those quiet first hours. And, and he wants to talk to you and me. And he wants to lead us. But we've got to get to where he's leading us to those still waters. That, that deep place. Not just read a few verses. And, and that, or have a short devotion. But God wants us to spend some time with him. A lot of us are suffering from spiritual thirst and hunger. And the only thing that's going to restore your soul is, is getting some good time with God. Not just a little short fly-by minute or two. Because he wants to restore your soul. Let me ask you a question. Do you want him to restore your soul? Do you really want him to? Or, or, do, or you just want him to do some good things for you, make you feel good? Do, do you want to lie down in the green pasture where he puts you? Whatever the situation is, does do you want to go into those deep waters with Jesus, those still, quiet, deep waters, and really hear what he wants you to say? Well, I've got a homework assignment for you. Y'all thought y'all were out of school, didn't you? Got a homework assignment. I want you to this week take three separate one-hour periods. One hour. Three separate one-hour periods and just seek God. Be alone with God. Cut everything else out. 
Maybe you're running around now and you, you're not knowing what's going on and you don't know what direction to go in. And God wants to lead you beside the still waters. He wants to make you lie down in the green pastures. He wants to restore your soul. But you've got to get to the place where you'll let him. So I want you to spend just three separate one-hour periods with him this week. Hebrews 10 says, let us draw near with a sure heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil, evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Choose, a, choose a, a time, choose a place, and choose a passage of Scripture. When, when you take these three separate one-hour periods, don't just go in and, 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 and pray and flip open the Bible and say, God, show me, you know. Take some time. I, I, go through John chapter 15 through chapter 21. But you take some time and you spend it. That's, that's when Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven and he starts talking and telling his disciples what he's praying for them and what he wants to happen in their lives. That's John chapters 15 through 21. That would be a good place to start. But, but choose a time and choose a place and meditate on the Word of God. This is what I want you to do. I want you to do what we call inductive Bible study. I want you to take the Word of God. It would be, it'd be just as well if you don't even have notes in your Bible. Take a Bible and read through that chapter. And then read through it again. And ask questions. Why is this? What is this? How is this? And just keep reading through it and letting God speak to you. And just open your heart and open your ears, open your mind. Speak to me, Lord. I want you to do that this week. And I, I, want, you to, I want you to find those peaceful waters and that green pasture. And, and, and I want you to be still and, and know that, that he is God. And, and take the word and, and let, let, it, let it meditate on, meditate on it and, and let it have its effect in your heart. And then go out and apply it. Isaiah chapter 26 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, who mind, whose mind is remaining on you because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever. So if you, if you want to be in God's will and you want to know what, what he wants you to do, then I challenge you this week. Give him some time and listen to what he wants to tell you. We've been going over several names for God. We're going to go over eight names for God uh, as we go through this study in, in, in Psalm chapter 23. Uh, last week we, we talked about two names for God, and this week we're going to talk about two more. Jehovah Shalom is one uh, that's Hebrew, sort of kind of Hebrew. It's transliterated Hebrew into English, but anyway, Jehovah Shalom, and it means the Lord my peace. Shalom means peace. It means the, the, the peace that passes all understanding kind of thing, and that's, that's the God it, 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 that, that he wants to be for you and me. He's, he's the God that that he wants us to say within our hearts, it's well with my soul. It is well with my soul, no matter what's going on around me. So, Jehovah Shalom. I say that with me. Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord my peace. The next thing in this passage today is, is God wants us to understand that, that he has a path for us. He has a course for our life. He has a way that he wants us to go. It's a path that, that he's chosen for us. And we need to see it. Lost people need to see it. Everybody needs to see and know the path God has chosen for you. He's got a particular path for you. The psalmist puts it this way. He leads me in the paths or the way of righteousness for his namesake. Paths could be translated way just as easily. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Uh, we have a lot of choices in life. But there's only really one right choice, and that's God's choice. God wants to direct our outcomes. But God makes sure that trials are a part of our lives because he wants to highlight our need to walk by faith and not by sight. If you're going through trials right now, let me tell you, the Bible says count it all joy when you go through trials. And if you're going through trials, I don't care what it is, might be little ones, might be big ones, might be just overwhelming trials, God wants to draw you closer to him. He wants to highlight your need to walk by faith and not by sight and to walk uh, with him and to trust him. Trust him, not your bank account, not your job. Trust Jesus. That's what gets us into trouble. We start trusting 
in ourselves, in our bank account, in our ability, and in how we've made it. God can take that away from you tomorrow. It can be gone. You've you got, you got to let him be your shepherd at all times. His primary reason for going to the cross was not my happiness. It wasn't to make me happy. His primary reason for going to the cross was to show me the way, to lead me, to shepherd me, and for me to place my faith in him and him alone. Folks, I'm preaching to myself this morning. I don't know. Y'all can listen in if you want to. But you know, I, I, I need I need for him to be my shepherd. And too often I'm not letting him be my shepherd. And I'm getting in all kinds of pastures I don't need to get into. Getting a funk, you know that? I get in a funk when I don't let the Lord be my shepherd. I get depressed. I get down. I want to quit. I want to throw in the towel. I want to give up. Y'all don't get like that, do you? Psalm 143 says, Make me to know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Make me to know the way. You know, that's what we need to do. God, make me know the way. That's like praying for patience, you know. People say, don't pray for patience because, man, God will put something on you where you're going to have to have some patience. Well, this is the same thing. Make me to know your way. I don't care what it happens. Listen, I've only got a short time on this earth. I want to be ready when I arrive in heaven. I want him to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I, I want to be ready. So make me know your way. Make me lie down in the green pastures. Sometimes that's the only way I'm going to get there. You've got to make me. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his way. Who fears the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? You know, my daddy, I feared. I love my daddy. My daddy loved me. You know, but I knew there was a line. I crossed it once or twice. I didn't want to go there. You know, I, I had fear for him. It's nothing, fear is not necessarily something bad. We need to fear the Lord. We need to know that, 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 that he, can, he can cause some things to come into our life to help us mature and grow. He, he can discipline us. He can chastise us. He says those whom he loves, he chastises. In Exodus says, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. You know, when we search and we hunger and thirst for Jesus, we hunger and thirst for righteousness, then you're going to be filled. Life knocks at our door every morning when we get up, when, before our feet hit the floor. And it offers us choices to pursue. And we just need to include God in those choices. We, we need to let him be the shepherd he wants to be. And say, God, guide me today. Instead, I get out of the bed and I've made a thousand choices, you know, before I walk out the door. And I haven't really consulted God in most of them. It's just things I do. You know, first thing we should do in the morning is, is not say, good Lord, it's morning. It's good morning, Lord, you know. That's an old one, but it works. When you make the Lord your shepherd, he will guide you in the right path. Claim that. He wants to. He'll make his principles. He'll make his ways, his right ways known to you. And he'll, he'll do it through his word. So when you make him your shepherd, he will definitely guide you on the right path. Our problem is, you know, if we're just honest with one another, we just don't want to do it his way. So often there are commandments in the Bible I just don't want to do. I mentioned one already. We need to meditate on this word. We need to study. We need to take an hour at least three times a week and spend it with God. I don't have time for that. I've got a lot of other important things to do. Well, that's why we get in all these wrong pastures. You know, we start thinking, I know the best way. <laughs> Proverbs 14 speaks to that. There's a way, a path that seems right to a man, but in its end is, its end is the way or the path to, to death. Some paths look okay for a while, but then we start going down them and we realize, oh, this wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Uh, God wants to lead us in the right path. And, and, and as long as we're in control of our lives and we're shutting God out and we're not really spending time with him and in his word, uh, th then we're going we're to get off on the wrong path. Psalm says the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way or his path. When he delights, do you, do you delight in God? Do you, do you really want what God wants for you? 
You know, I have to admit, sometimes I just want myself. I want my own way. But if you want your steps to be established, if you want to know you're on the right track, then you've got to dwell on the Lord God. You've got to look to Him. You've got to delight in Him. You've got to, you've got to have a relationship with Him. You know, too many of us are just into Christianity. We're just into religion. <laughs> We're not into Jesus. And I talk about it, and I talk about it, and I talk about it, and, and then I don't obey it like I should. But, you know, every day we need to develop that relationship with Jesus. You need to walk with him, and you need to talk with him, and you need to love him. And if you're out here doing things that go contrary to his word, listen, you're going to feel guilty, and you're going to say, I can't have that relationship with him. You know, the, you know what you should do right then is you should confess your sin and say, God, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. And, and then he will forgive you, and then you can have a right relationship with him. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He wants to lead me on the right path. That's what the path of righteousness is. It's the right path. Do you want to be on the right path? That's the question. Do you want to be on the right path, or do you want to keep doing it your way? Do you want to be on the one God orders, or you'll order? Do you want to be in the kingdom of God, or do you want to be in the the kingdom of self. I want to give you some instruction on how to get on the right path. Y'all want this? How to get on the right path. I don't know if you do or not, but we're going to give it to you. Here it goes. You find the right path through God's word. You find the right path through God's word. Psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You ever had to go into a dark room looking for something and you can't find it and you're stumbling over everything and you can't find the light switch? That's a, that's a, that's a terrible feeling, you know, and you got to find it and you want it, but you can't find the light switch and you, don't, you can't see anything and you're totally dark. Well, you need to turn on the light, you know, and if you finally find that light switch and you turn it on, you can see, you know, and that's what we need to do spiritually with God. And we do that through his word. And, and this, you don't, to, to hear from God, you don't rub the Bible like it's a lamp and hoping it'll pop open to the right verse. You get in it and you study in it day in and day out. You might have a particular need and you're over in Leviticus reading. You know, keep reading in Leviticus. God will show you. You know, but, but study his word. No, oh, yes, open it up in different places sometimes, but, but have a method of studying regularly feed on the Word of God. If you want to be in the paths of righteousness, another way to get there is you find the right path through godly counsel. The Bible says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. I've been talking a lot lately about being discipled, and we need to be with other Christians who are holding us accountable to live the way God's called us to live. The problem with most of us is, me too, is we come to church and, and we, we, we're in a crowd and, and the preacher preaches and sometimes the Holy Spirit might say, yes, you need that. And in your heart, you're, you're aligned with the Holy Spirit. And you say, yeah, I need that. I want to do that. And then we go out into the world and by Wednesday, we were just defeated. I failed. I can't do that. That's just too hard. We need somebody there to encourage us during the week. Or we go to Sunday school on Sunday morning, same thing kind of happens, and, and we get challenged, and we say, yes, that's the way I want to live my life. That's the right way. But during the week, sometimes we, we just get lost in all the stuff going on. Well, we need people who are in prayer with us, who we're accountable to. We need wise counsel from people who are also trying to seek God and seek his will. We get too much counsel from people, you know, in, 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 down, at, down at work, and, and they're not even Christians. And, and they're telling us, yeah, hey, I'm not really happy in my marriage. Well, get out of it. <laughs> That's not good advice. Uh, you need to do what makes you happy. <laughs> That's not good advice. Uh, you need to what, do what will bring joy. Deep-rooted joy, and only God can bring you that joy. You need to do what he wants you to do. You need godly counsel. You know, remember, I, I can remember as a, as a young person, you know, getting even into my early 20s and doing something that I did was ashamed to tell my daddy or afraid to tell my daddy because I was afraid my daddy was going to say, son, that wasn't the right way to do it. <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to hear correction. And I knew in my heart that really I had not made the wisest choice in the world, but I didn't want him to know it because I didn't want to hear it from him. 
You know, that's the way we are. Uh, but we need godly counsel. We need to listen. Even if, even if God tells us it's a bad plan and we've got to reverse course, we've got to do it. You find the right path through the Spirit's prompting. <clears throat> Bible says, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2. A lot of us want God to guide us, but we don't want the Bible to guide us. We want God to guide us, but not the Bible. Well, see, you can, that's, that's the same thing. If the Bible says do it or don't do it, then that's what we need to do or don't do. God's not going to tell you to do something that's contrary to his word. I don't know how many times in my Christian life I've heard people tell me, well, God told me to do that. I married that joker because God told me to do it. And, and he wasn't a Christian and he had a drinking problem and, you know, he didn't have a job. God didn't tell you to marry that person. I don't believe. <laughs> God says don't be unequally yoked. That's what the word of God, but I'm in love. <laughs> You're probably, uh, uh. <laughs> all right. He wants you to walk in the paths that produce righteousness. I'm going to give you a pop quiz. You thought you were out of school again. Which way produces righteousness? Answer A or B. I grow the most when things are easy and good and going great. Or I mature more in difficult times I would not have chosen myself. B. Be. That's when we learn. That's what God's trying. Well, we might wish it's not true, but that's the way it is. Listen, there are no roses without pruning. There's no gold without, without the fire. There are no diamonds without pressure. <laughs> Job chapter 23 says, Job says, He knows the way that I take when he has tried me, and I shall come out as gold. Often we pray for, for easier paths when we should be praying for stronger shoes. Right? Path you're on, path God puts you on might be tough, but it's going to be the best one for you. It's the path that God can lead you. He wants you to be in the path of righteousness. Righteousness is the state of being fully and totally right. Now, we can't ever get there, but that's where we need to be trying to head. We need to be on the path of righteousness. We need to be looking and going after what's totally right, and we find that through the Word of God. We find it through godly counsel, and we find it through the Spirit's prompting. And why do we all do this? It's for His name's sake. God's reason for wanting you on the paths of righteousness is for His name's sake. It's for His glory. When you glorify God then you're going to put him first in your life. And when you put him first in your life and you seek to glorify him and you tell all your friends how good your God is, then God begins to work in your heart and you begin to see him more clearly and you begin to understand his will better. When you glorify him, when you praise him, when you make him the, the sole reason for your existence. Last word I'm going to give you for Jehovah is Jehovah Sidkenu, which means the Lord, my righteousness. God grows and shapes you and me in trials. Trials. So, so, that, so that he can make his light shine into the world through us. Too often we're rebellious and we just don't want God to do it. Surveys today say that Christians don't look any different much from, from other people in the world. And the reason that is, is we're going by our own desires. We're living in our own kingdom instead of in the kingdom of God and you know, if we want the world to change, the world definitely needs to change. We're going down a lot, a lot of the long, wrong paths and the wrong roads, and the world needs to change. But it's not going to change until it sees examples of righteousness within it. Listen, non-believers are not the only ones that, that get cancer or see their marriages blown apart or, or lose their jobs or get in financial disasters or lose their children. They're not the only ones. Believers do that too. But what's your response? How do you behave when bad things come, when difficult times come? Are you choosing love over hate? Are you choosing forgiveness over, over bitterness? Are you choosing hope over despair? Because people are watching. 
Do you choose the path of righteousness for his name's sake? Are you gaining the victory? And the only way you can gain the victory is, is to see Jesus and, and to seek him with all your heart. Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise from the day, grave so we could have some kind of false pseudo-religious life. He wanted to transform us. He wants absolute victory. Is your life different from those of unbelievers? Are you overcoming? Are you raising the flag in Jesus' name? Is he leading you in the paths of righteousness? I've given you a challenge this morning to, to take three separate hours this week and spend it with God and see what it does for you. It might mean you've got to get up an hour earlier. But I am challenging, I'm encouraging you to do this because God wants to lead you. God wants you to get the victory in your life. And you might think the pasture you're in right now is not very green, but it might be the exact pasture God wants you in. <laughs> and if you'll look to him, it'll become a lot greener.